it's this odd thing of so you'd rat so today you've got you know let's call co2 an emission is going out so it's like I have a I have trash and I'm driving down the road and I just throw it down on the road as opposed to putting it into a bin today. That that so what you would rather me do is throw it on the road and then you'd go hire someone, you know, 10 years in the future to go find that trash and pull it out of the atmosphere as opposed to you know helping me, you know, put it into the bin today. My name is Max Gagliardi, and this is Always Be Building. If you're watching this video, take a moment, hit the subscribe button on YouTube, or you can follow me on your favorite podcast app. Hope you enjoy the show. It's been a while since you've been on. Good to see you. Thanks for coming back on. It is good to see you as well. I mean, it's summertime in Houston and Oklahoma, so uh, markets have been interesting. You know, I know you're doing a bunch of stuff and happy to update people on what's going on in the uh, in the world as well but uh thanks for having me back on yeah for sure since the last time we've talked you've made a change you're now in the carbon capture space and i we haven't done like a dedicated episode on carbon capture stuff so i'd love to get into the weeds a little bit hear about what you're doing now and i ask you some questions i've looked at the space a little bit you know for a period of time we were looking at some investments there and uh never could get to pulling the trigger but um but yeah start off with just uh Keep kind of updating people on where you're at today and uh, we'll go from there. Yeah. So I joined a company called Carbon Vert um, last fall. I uh, really got introduced to them. Uh, I guess it'd be probably 2021 timeframe. Uh, founded by Alex Tiller and Jan Sherman. Uh, Jan's our chief development officer and we were engineers at Shell together a long time ago. Uh, and then Alex Tiller, uh, his brother, Nick, had been a longtime client, and Alex is super knowledgeable around the tax equity world. And you know, the benefit of carbon is, is that you know, I think that you've got real economics and real infrastructure, and it enables you know, the transition without having to fully scrap everything we do in the energy world and the agriculture world uh, as we're you know, moving projects forward. So I've been really focused on you know, what's going on. And then IRA juiced the economics and Carbon Vert's been lucky enough to be partnered with Chevron and Talos. And I think could be argued as one of the largest storage sites, particularly in Southeast Texas between Houston and Port Arthur called the Bayou Bend project. And so been raising capital, um, you know, just really just pressing things forward. Uh, we own a quarter, Talos owns a quarter, and Chevron owns 50% as the operator. Um, and it'll be a gigaton of storage at least, and you know, 10 to 20 million tons per annum. So it's a it's a very, very meaningful project. Um, and then we have several other projects that we're advancing as well. I mean, my whole focus though has been on markets and tax equity and kind of tax credit monetization, uh, because not everybody's a taxpayer and you know, while 85 to $180 a ton of tax credits get you a long way, uh, do you think you need to build market solutions as well uh, to make the economics work? So that's been my uh, my real job uh, day in and day out. Man, a ton to cover with this. So first of all, I think it would be interesting to just get your high level thoughts on the opportunities and challenges, um, just kind of from the 30,000 foot view, and then we'll dig into these, uh, and, and by ch opportunities and challenges, I mean, with specifically with carbon capture. The energy transition and carbon capture is the convergence of policy, which is both federal and state. So Washington, DC, it's technology development, uh, which is really, I'd call, you know, kind of venture like investing of the West coast merging with Houston, Texas and, you know, detailed and hard infrastructure, very midstream like almost, but more of a, a rail line, because once you get a storage site operating with pipelines to it, I think that you'll just see these, these sites expand and expand and expand. And once you start putting carbon into the ground, uh, those hubs will end up being, you know, massive storage sites, you know, for the next 30, 50, 100 years, um, as we're really trying to abate some of the hard to abate you know, emission sectors. Um, and so it's this convergence of DC, um, you know, state policy now with, you know, Louisiana pressing forward with, you know, primacy for drilling wells. Texas is doing the same. Uh, North Dakota, Wyoming, 
you know, Nebraska have kind of moved a little bit faster on kind of the overall policies. Um, but it is just an interesting uh, time. You know, the, the issue on most projects though that are new is you have this timeline of a project where you do pre-study and you can have these off ramps all the way through you know, any individual project. On a carbon capture project, you have a storage site, you have a pipeline and you have an emitter and really multiple you know, emitters that are all going through that process simultaneously. And so the economics become this real matrix of time, cost, you know, value, and then even a social license to operate for a long period of time. Yeah, that's good. Do you think around the main opportunities, I mean, it's obviously the large emitters, you've got power plants, you've got concrete manufacturers or facilities, whatever you call them. You've got the LNG corridor, uh, walk through some of the, I mean, some of these are no brainers, but walk through maybe some of the ones that are, that I, identified there, but maybe some other mm -hmm. cases that people might not think about. Yeah, I think that you're you're hitting on the right components. I mean, one of the key things is like percentage of CO2. The higher percentage of CO2 your stream is, the easier it is to capture. Um, so that's the that's kind of a technical, simple way to think about things. And then on the other side, you have greenfield projects that are new projects and brownfield projects that are you know, kind of like replumbing your house while you're living in it uh, if you're trying to do capture. And so there's some complications around that. And, and then really it's a technical readiness level. Um, and whenever I said social license to operate, I've, I've defined the world as like on one hand, you know, the most desirable charismatic thing that you know, Microsoft or Amazon would wanna buy is direct air capture into geologic storage um, and then like the least desirable thing would be coal-fired power plant into enhanced oil recovery. Mm -hmm. And there's this spectrum of, of value and you're seeing some of the, you know, really green field, like charismatic projects are getting, you know, thousands of dollars a ton, you know, to advance the technology of, you know, direct air removal or CDR uh, into storage. The, the tough part is, is to do a large geologic project, you know, we need millions of tons per annum to, to really get the storage site and pipelines built. And that tends to be, you know, more legacy projects, like you said, LNG facilities. You're, you're in the Midwest, you're seeing ethanol, you know, capture because that's essentially pure CO2, but then that requires pipelines uh, or rail that'll be thousands of miles long. You know, our project at Bayou Bend, you know, the offshore component is just south of Port Arthur, where, you know, the original spindle top was. The onshore component is just east of kind of the Galveston-Houston ship channel. And so it really offers this, you know, com combination of, of both um, short pipelines and massive emissions uh, and an option of do you want to take CO2 offshore or onshore, uh, which, you know, has some uh, kind of some emitters have desire for one or the other um, as things roll. The challenge is chicken and the egg. Like it is across the board, you know, if you're a financer, like you have a question of, do you actually have site control on a storage site? Do you have term sheets on any emissions? Do you have control over any emissions? You know, how hard is it going to be for you to get permits for right of way for pipelines versus, you know, well permits that are, you know, governed by the EPA in class six? You know, candidly, our our um, our governing uh, permits right now seem to be pipelines more than Class Six wells, uh, but the world focuses on you know Class Six, which does take a lot of time as well. And then once you have all that signed up, you need a you know financial party to underwrite um, a duration that is you know twelve years at a minimum for IRA tax credits to. But these projects, like I said, will operate you know, 20, 30, 40 years. Um, and so will you have those tax credits extended the same way uh, that we expect the solar and wind and ethanol credits have been extended? And once the government kind of opens up those credits, it feels like the, the likely path is you'll continue to encourage CO2 going in the ground long-term. So those credits will extend, but there aren't guarantees of that. I really think this is an interesting concept around the social aspect of it in uh, you bringing up like the direct air capture versus say a coal plant and how that, you know, 
fits with the license here on what uh, the public as well as the policymakers want carbon capture companies to focus on. And I think that the pushback I've seen from the environmental side is, well, if this like enables, you know, fossil fuel companies to continue to, you know, be able to produce and be able to be operational, even if it lowers their CO2, that's not a good thing because it's perpetuating it and we need to get away from it. I think the realists and the centrists realize that there's always going to be some level that we need and they're more focused on emissions and can we reduce those? And then you've got like, to your point, maybe these corporate types uh, that are in a tech, the tech world, or maybe the airlines or some other industry that, that needs the, that wants these credits and wants mm -hmm. to back these projects. And maybe they like the direct air capture more or something like that, because it just, it distances them from the fossil fuel industry. Um, what do you, you know, if you characterize that and you look at it, are there, do you think it's easier to, is that a, re, is that a fair characterization in terms of what I'm saying? Uh, I think the thing you, that, so we've talked or I've talked to you know, all the, all the major buyers of voluntary credits in the market. And, and what I think is the, you know, a lot of the headlines around tech companies that are buying credits is they have a relatively low volume of emissions, you know, hundred thousand tons per annum, 200,000 tons per annum. And, and so you can go out and spend high dollars per ton for a small volume. But if you're, you know, Delta airlines and you've got, millions of tons per annum, you know, mm -hmm. they've come under a lot of scrutiny because they bought nature-based projects that you know, don't have the same level of measurement, reporting, and verification, and then therefore auditing at the end of the day. You know, our projects, it, you understand Midstream Max, and you know, it's going to be CO2 flows through a meter, goes into a pipeline, flows through a meter, and goes into the ground. And so it's like completely auditable and accounting and like it is CO2 is CO2, you know, from a technical standpoint and from, you know, what's in the atmosphere. You know, the, the issue on the charismatic side though, is if you, if you really touch anything that is fossil, it's just hard for that to go into a sustainability report and read well, and you don't have to go touch anything that is a uh, legacy energy because your volumes and your demand for offsets aren't that high. And so the nature side will solve that. You know, if you're trying to get into heavy industry, though, I think that's where, you know, some of the brownfield projects actually uh, and capturing emissions from an existing LNG facility, you know, is something that I think companies will help start sponsoring and, you know, will buy those voluntary markets. You know, we're going to see in the near term, you know, Oxy marketing, you know, through their 1.5, their direct air capture uh, facilities um, at scale. And so that'll be an interesting mark of a, a much higher volume of uh, direct air capture coming to market and what price point do they attract. Uh, but the industrial side is something that, you know, is going to be, um, you know, have to be a little less charismatic. One, one of the ways I've talked to, you know, if it's a European bank or if it's a financial institution or an advisory firm, you know, or these tech companies, it's this odd thing of, so you'd rat, so today you've got, you know, let's call CO2 an emission is going out. So it's like, I have a, I have trash and I'm driving down the road and I just throw it down on the road as opposed to putting it into a bin today. That, that, so what you would rather me do is throw it on the road and then you'd go hire someone, you know, 10 years in the future to go find that trash and pull it out of the atmosphere as opposed to, you know, helping me, you know, put it into the bin today. And, and that logic, I mean, it's like hard to argue that CO2 is CO2. And if you can reduce today, that actually is accomplishing, you know, some of the same goals as, as remove in the future. Um, but then their brains vapor lock around, you know, is that tied to methane uh, and everything else associated with it. Uh, but there's this gradual, I think, progression that's going to happen, like you said, around some of the the true um, centrists and norms of, you know, dealing with, you know, just putting, putting that CO2 in the storage bin today, as opposed to trying to go find it at 0.2% from the atmosphere in 2035. Um, and, and that logic, I think is going to start becoming more and more clear. Now, yeah, it's, there's always this kind of bifurcation line between the goals and like what we're trying to achieve and then the ways to get there like nuclear energy is a good example. It's a great way to reduce uh, carbon emissions. It's been shunned uh, for other technologies for whatever reason. Maybe there's more 
uh, special interests or money going into it. Maybe there's safety concerns, whatever it may be. It's always kind of like we, you know, a lot of people agree on the outcome, but then the getting there seems to be the part where a lot of people disagree. And there's like a lot of kind of no brainer things that I think people skip over that could work and they could do things today and quicker. And I love your analogy, but then they're like, yeah, but you know, for whatever reason, some preconceived notion of being associated with fossils or some, you know, bias that they have. And it just takes us down these meandering paths that aren't as straight of a line as I think we could get to with carbon reduction. Um, yeah. If you want, I mean, the thing is if you want long-term direct air capture or CDR, um, you need to have storage sites. And so maybe there's a little bit of, you know, near-term pain of your tied to a fossil fuel project to get the storage site and pipeline mm -hmm. and emissions going. And so over time, that storage transitions towards, you know, a sustainable aviation fuel in the future or, you know, a, a power plant um, that has a little better emissions control than a coal po power plant or, you know, a lot of direct air capture hubs. And so I think that's the other way that we've been talking about it is like, yeah, maybe you need to sponsor the storage to happen. And without that sponsorship of storage, uh, you end up in a tight situation of, you know, again, your direct air capture doesn't have anywhere to go. If some, some genius, you know, snaps something and we can do direct air capture at much lower costs, which, you know, at scale, those things should reduce. Um, but it just is a, uh, it's a relatively longer road. You know, towards the end of the decade, as opposed to right now, we're working on bringing things online and registering projects in you know, 2025, 2026, 2027. Um, and a lot of direct air capture is going to be, you know, plus five years before they get to millions of tons uh, beyond that time frame. Yeah. Direct air capture is so futuristic to me. It's like terraforming. Uh, it's like off a sci-fi show, right? Where you got these like terraform machines trying to change the world. I mean, like it could... It just seems way more uh, futuristic and nebulous, and I've not studied it very much than just to your point, just kind of the direct going to the source. Let's make it happen today. Talking about the storage side, this is just for my ignorance. What is the life cycle of these storage uh, plays? Like, how can you continue to expand it? Are there capacity limitations? Like, just walk me through some of the nuts and bolts, because like I quite frankly don't know the answer to it. So you typically are storing CO2 um, six plus thousand feet underground. And so you're well below any, you know, fresh water, you're, you're drilling wells that are cased all the way to the surface, as opposed to, you know, any, um, you're not hanging anything. And so essentially you're cemented to surface and you're sealed off, uh, you're injecting, and then your CO2 is going in, you know, almost at a liquid dense phase is what they call it. And so it's flowing a much higher volume than as a gas into these deep saline aquifers. You know, then that bubble, you know, starts to form. Um, and over time, you know, you have CO2 moving deeper into the formation. You know, it actually spreads out. So the bubble expands as long as you're injecting. You know, what you're doing is you have monitoring wells on the fringes. And those wells will be the most boring data collection sites in the world. They should never see any pressure or temperature changes. You know, they're essentially the, the very edge of where you think you have this, you know, thick either salt or shale seal um, that is keeping the CO2 in, in the reservoir that you're injecting into. You know, let's just say one of those wells sees like pressure. Well, you stop injecting and then that bubble stops expanding. And so it really is like a fully controlled, you know, process of, you know, the plume or the bubble of CO2 is going where you think it's going to go. Over the long term, you know, CO2 will react with the reservoir and it mineralizes into calcium carbonates, which is really uh, what some of the projects are doing, you know, climb works and, you know, some enhanced weathering of limestones, you know, really are, are binding that CO2, you know, either in their capture process or in their storage sites um, where you, you know, form rock uh, over time. Um, when you think about the geology of these plays it's like conventional geology though there's going to be other zones that you can inject into and then satellite fields around them and so i think once you build a large-scale pipeline you know metering system allocation system compressions and and pumps you'll end up continuing to use that surface equipment to you know flow other captured volumes into satellites and so i think the storage 
you know, sites continue to expand um, over time. And, and I, I think that's really how storage works. And so the durability and the permanence, um, you know, really is something that's fully engineered and monitored uh, both through those monitoring wells and then, you know, 4D or seismic over time will be the other factor. And you know, there's been CO2 injected in a field uh, in the North Sea called the Sleipner field uh, into a deep saline aquifer since the mid 90s. And, you know, you can see the that CO2 evolving um, over time, you know, and it's still injecting today. And so it it's modelable through reservoir modeling. It's kind of the reverse of the oil and gas sector as opposed to pulling it out of the ground, you're putting it in. You know, the other benefit though is, you know, these volumes are stable. And so that's why I think of them more as, as opposed to oil and gas that depletes over time, uh, you're really um, just expanding at a stable um, injectivity rate, which you know, actually makes the economics um, a little bit better and, and allows you to you know, have returns that are more midstream like returns as opposed to you know, some of the risk economics around you know, oil and gas. Yeah, that's interesting. What about the uh, moving to like the economics and commercial side? Mm -hmm. You've got a uh, you've got the you know, the infrastructure provider and then you've got the emitters themselves. There's classifications around who can claim the credits. Um, back when I was looking at it, it was a challenge because the emissions people have to claim those, I think, or they have to be the ones that are able to get those right. You can't be the midstream provider, basically, or the infrastructure provider and get those. You can, you're basically providing a fee for service. Is that right? And then from there, it's, uh, the typical commercial st structures, like a midstream contract where you're getting a fee, you're getting a dedication, you're getting a long-term commitment. You are, you know basically binding yourself to provide this service. There's performance aspects to it, but just walk through how like these deals are structured, how they get done. What are some of those key points you got to work through when you're mm -hmm. trying to make this happen? Yeah. So every, you know, emitter has a different desire, but you know, generally you have a, a cost of capture, a cost of transport and a cost of storage. Um, the storage sites have, I'll, I'll talk about that first. Um, you have a royalty and fee structure that you're paying to the landowner. Okay. Um, you know, that can be anything from a dollar per acre, you know, to a, you know, fixed fee over time to a, you know, a fee that's like a percentage of proceeds, depending upon how much CO2 is going in the ground. Hmm. Um, and those tend to be, you know, T with, you know, time plus renewals, um, you know, on a certain volume, you know, the pipelines are very, very you know, standard, you know, they're like, uh, G and P, you know, gathering and processing contracts with volume commitments and, you know, fee minimums. Um, some are percentage of proceeds, but I think most transport is going to be, you know, kind of a volume with a term, um, which is kind of 12 to 20 to 30 years, depending upon the emitter. Um, and then depending upon term, you know, the dollar per ton fee, you know, varies, um, longer term is a lower fee as you're depreciating that pipeline over a longer term as opposed to shorter term. Now the emission side, you know, it's really a negotiation of, you know, you have your compliance market, which is your 45 Q tax credit. And then you have, um, you know, ways to generate revenues beyond that, that could be, you know, lower CI score products. And so you can make an e-methanol and ship it to Europe and they'll pay a higher dollar amount for that. You could have a sustainable aviation fuel that you try to sell, you know, into the LCFS market uh, in California or, you know, the emerging markets in the Northwest or, you know, down the road, um, other areas, or you could just have a voluntary credit created, uh, which are then, you know, bought and sold on the voluntary carbon markets. And, you know, that volume is something that's going to grow a lot. Um, mm. But the emitters, it's just a negotiation and some want to consume all the tax credits. Uh, some, you know, don't pay any income taxes at all or a very low amount. Um, and so need to transfer those credits, uh, which is going to have some, some friction costs to it that uh, just for perspective, you know, if you're transferring, um, so these are production tax credits, not investment tax credits like the solar and wind side. Uh, yeah. So they're a little easier for direct transfer, um, but it'll probably be 10 to 15% friction beyond that first five years of direct pay from the government. Um, 
but that's kind of the way I've thought about it. And I, I've used this other analogy in just our Bayou Bend partnership as a as a way to think about the value of those credits. And so remember Chevron's 50%, Talos is 25% and Carbonvert is 25%. You know, so Chevron, let's say we are doing 10 million tons per annum, you know, that's $850 million a year of tax credits that are available. You know, for them, you know, they trade at probably at least a 10 times multiple. So if you flow those tax, that 50% of the credit mm. through for them, you know, they are going to get a higher value for it than you know, like a Talos Energy that's trading at, you know, two to three times multiples from a stock price. You know, the value of the credit, if they actually consume it themselves, isn't as high as it is for Chevron. And then Carbonvert, you know, pays very little in, in, in taxes. I mean, we do pay some, um, but that, you know, credit probably is better consumed by a party that has a higher, you know, higher value proposition for consuming it. And, and that's where things start getting complicated because the market, you know, for all intangible tax credits, all solar, wind, all the biofuels, you know, it's been kind of 18 to $20 billion a year. And mm -hmm. traditionally financial institutions consume those. Those are, you know, banks and pensions and insurance companies. I just talked about one of our projects. So Bayou Bend as a whole, let's say it's 20 million tons per year. You know, at $85 a ton, you know, we're going to just our one project will add 10% to the entire global ITC market in production wow. taxes. And that's just us. So think about Oxy, Exxon, Denberry, CRC, you know, Talos has other projects. You know, you've got the whole navigator uh, system in the Midwest that's trying to do injection. You know, you're going to see more in Wyoming. And so there's this flood of production tax credits that are coming into a market that you know, is going to dwarf the 18 to $20 billion of ITCs. And unless, you know, we're thinking through ways to build up that market, because if you don't build buyers for that, whenever you flood supply into a market, what happens right. to price? Uh, it goes the wrong way. And then those tax credits are worth less. And then the economics of capture go down. Uh, the same thing is going to happen in hydrogen. Um, I've seen some studies from some of the energy transition investment funds that, um, you know, the, the whole production tax credits from IRA uh, can dwarf like all of corporate taxes paid in America wow. um, as they get transferred. And so it's this really interesting world um, of what happens with those tax credits and how do you transfer them efficiently. And that's one of the things that, you know, Alex and I and our team have been thinking a lot about. Man, that's super interesting. So a bunch of stuff you said, they got my wheels spinning. Like the uh, <clears throat> the company's trading at different multiples and the value that they receive for those is super fascinating. Hadn't really thought about that. The flooding the market piece and the supply and the demand aspect is, is really interesting. Um, and this is more probably affecting the emitters themselves and who signs up for these projects in terms of their economics as the infrastructure provider are you getting exposure it's almost like commodity exposure are you getting that exposure um or are you more just this take or pay provider that's getting like a volume commitment like where is your there's kind of you... cart and ocker carbon solutions probably did the best job of outlining this a few years ago but this is really what we're seeing so i'm uh just reflecting there's like a carbon as a service model Right. That is, man, we're, we've got CO2 emissions, come and capture it, whatever way you want to do it, just take it that you're, you take it all by our CO2 is even coming up for some of the utilization companies. There are companies that are saying, I want to consume your CO2 for some end use. And so I'll buy that and just take it and I'll, I'll monetize the tax credits. I'll transfer them. I'll figure everything out. You don't have to worry about it. Uh, we take it inside your fence and we're a waste hauler, waste management right. inc then have this kind of range bound set of contracts that you, know, you have a floor and a ceiling as far as dollar per ton or duration. Uh, and then you just have a fixed fee, which tends to be um, kind of the starting point for most discussions, but definitely not the ending point um, is, is how that service works. And so if it's a fixed fee, if they're going to get $85 a ton, you know, let's say we get 20 to $35 a ton for transport and storage, for relatively short pipelines. You know, if you're in Europe or if you're in the Midwest, that transport cost, you know, in Europe, you've got to put it on a boat, you've got cross-border adjustments, 
got to figure out how to get it to Northern Lights in the North Sea. Um, that transport cost is much higher. And then the Navigator or Wolf Pipeline, you know, kind of those long haul pipelines from ethanol, you know, plants in the Midwest that have to go to the Illinois Basin or up to North Dakota. You know, those are thousands of miles of new CO2 lines um, where transport would be the majority of the cost there as well. Uh, I haven't spent as much time looking at their economics, um, but I, that's kind of how the swing works. But they're all doing, you know, minimum volume commitments with a duration and, and probably some upside. You know, the issue on ethanol that, you know, we saw and, you know, back in whenever, you know, COVID happened, all those ethanol plants shut in. And so, or, you know, the social license of how long do you want to consume, you know, food products to make fuels. Yeah, you know, I think right. there's some long dated questions, um, you know, that we think about a lot as far as signing up an emitter for, you know, 10, 15, 20 years. Um, but, you know, that's those economics, you know, I think those projects will keep going for some amount of time, but there is some, you know, latent risk as well to you know, how long do those plants run? Yeah, that's interesting. So there is like a, in the traditional midstream sense, there's a bit of a credit play with these counterparties, but it sounds like most in terms of them making the commitment and then you got to get the financing. So you're backing it with that mm -hmm. and they're going to look at, Hey, what's the viability of this company committing to this? Um, but you are taking some of the commodity exposure a little bit too, which, um, it's pretty fascinating. I mean, there's more moving pieces to that. Um, than I would have thought I was thinking more of just kind of a fee for service. What about like the government mm -hmm. side, you mentioned the IRA, uh, giving it a big boost. I haven't followed it as closely. Talk a little bit about that and uh, and what you guys are seeing there, what that did and what the landscape's currently looking like. Yeah, and so um, for those that don't know, you know, 2018, the dollar per ton for carbon capture bumped up. Uh, last year, IRA bumped it to $85 for industrial capture and $180 per ton for uh, direct air capture. And from um, where? Where was that at? Sorry, just to... I think it was 50 50, yes. in, and I don't know if there was a, I don't remember the direct air capture numbers um, off the top of my head. Um, but the reality, like 50 was kind of borderline for right. you know, high percentage CO2, like ethanol plants can make money at that. Um, you know, some ammonia, some in, you know, kind of, you know, very short haul, point to point, a little bit of LNG, you know, probably could as well. Um, as you think about the the economics, but you know the the issue though is, is again like for greenfield projects, you know you're you've got the emitter economics, and so like if you're a financing company that wants to do transport and storage, do you actually want to un underwrite the risk profile of you know some direct air capture hub as well? Um, they don't like, and then if you're an LNG facility. You know, and I, I won't use LNG, actually, a chemical plant manager, guy that I'm friends with, you know, for 30 years, you know, we were talking about, like, they have some very high percentage CO2, and then they have a lot of small boilers in their plant that would be flue gas that are, you know, less than 8% CO2. He's like, it's very easy for me to catch 70% of my total emissions off the plant, but that remaining 30 is he's the guy that used the analogy of, you know, replumbing and rewiring your house while you live in it um, mm. would be kind of the equivalent of catching the remainder. And there are some um, apprenticeship uh, rules that have always been in the government. But whenever you take government uh, credits, you know, your site then has to qualify for your job creation and, and, and apprenticeship um, that I don't know if are a big impediment, but are definitely something that or a concern or worry um, because those rules haven't been like hard established. Like the IRA, you know, established a general set of ideas as far as how Department of Treasury would issue. Um, but then you have to go through the rulemaking of how does it get implemented? What's the audit process? When do you submit, you know, your tons? How many tons was it? How do you verify that? You know, where do they send the tax? Um, credits to when is that paid like all of those details have been worked out and have been you know starting to be worked out through the first six months of this year and that clarity is starting to come um, as far as what the true you know financial model will be of where and how the you know government and department of treasury actually you know, send the money and execute that um, but all that wasn't clear um, 
and it's still not completely settled. Um, and so when you think about why things haven't happened faster, I think all of that policy, you know, you have the law implemented, and then you have all the execution of, you know, it's the um, definitive agreement and documentation of it that uh, using a business analogy has been, and then the comments to that can be hundreds and hundreds of comments uh, that we've waded through to try to understand what other people are worried about if we're missing anything um, or our, what are our comments around that. So, yeah. this, and then that same thing happens for EPA class six primacy. So as Louisiana wants, you know, wants primacy over drilling, you know, injection wells, you know, they're asking for comments by the end of June. And so like we and many others will submit our comments around their thoughts of taking over uh, Louisiana DNR from the EPA. And so like each one of these parts of the technical side and the financial side are all being formed and it's really pioneering um, this massive expansion of industry um, that requires rulemaking. You know, then companies have to figure out how we fit within that and then how we build, you know, agreements and you know, partnerships and then, you know, service agreements for, um, for the industry as well. And so it's all, it's like this hurry up and wait process again and again, almost every direction that we go, uh, has been my observation, man, like, uh, making a new market can be one of the most rewarding things that a company can get into. And if you look at it, I think the easiest thing to look at is like the technology side, cause these new innovations are always happening and it's like, it can be massively rewarding, lots of upside being a first mover especially there because there's the network effect. Um, but making a new market's also like super challenging uh, because you have to like figure your way through it all. And there's a lot of things that are just kind of gray, it seems like, where it's like you guys have to just, um, it's like no one's ever really done some of these things before. Maybe they've done them, but they're not done at this scale. Go ahead. Well, and that's why we exist. I mean, you know, we're 11 people at CarbonVert and we cover the financial side to the technical side. We've got a deep experience of operating CO2 facilities and permitting class six wells and getting RFPs done. But what, we're really an instigator. Like we're willing to take on that risk that, you know, some career person at one of the integrated companies or, you know, a European company, you know, may not um, put their career on the line, you know, to go out and submit and fill out an RFP. Uh, without having everything fully decided and commit millions of dollars of, you know, our own money and, you know, kind of friends and family money is how Alex and Jan started it. And really with that, though, you know, projects have gotten started. And now you saw us bring in Chevron as an example when they bought 50% of the Bayou Bend project. You know, that like, getting things started, there is this opportunity to get kind of the ball rolling or, you know, dominoes falling. And that's really what we're trying to do on both the voluntary markets with registering, you know, industrial projects, you know, kind of agnostically, depending upon the emissions type. Um, you know, we know transport and storage and, you know, we'll fill in the blank of, you know, what type of emissions it is and see what the market wants to buy or bear in a dollar per ton. We'll do the same thing for our own park projects and other people's. And so you know, we really just want, you know, market discovery um, and let capitalism really work around like who wants to buy what and at what price per ton. Um, secondly, there's the, you know, side of how do you work through tax credits and, you know, that long dated question. Um, and then there are like in any new industry, Max, I mean, you're, you've seen this as you've gotten into, you know, real estate and Bitcoin and a lot of other things. There's these always these like side um, I don't want to call them side hustles, but like real businesses that are alongside that are the places that you can make a lot of money. Um, you know, we see those as well. I, I think the one place that, you know, your first carbon trillionaire probably comes from, you know, whatever company unlocks direct air capture at a very low dollar mm -hmm. per ton. And that may be, you know, using an industrial process, or it may be, you know, using, you know, plants and, uh, I was you know, going to say trees is a joke. But tree. no, I mean, no, no, I think it's right. a lot. No, I've spent a lot of, I think that, you know, soil and, and ocean based, but mainly soil storage is something that I think is going to, you know, put gigatons of carbon in the ground um, and put it there permanently. And, you know, it, those things uh, will matter. And, you know, that's why I've got a lot of hope. You know, the, 
people are motivated by three things. Uh, generally love. I think love is the thing that motivates most, but then greed and fear motivate, you know, bigger groups. Like it's hard to love more than 20 or 30 people. Um, and so like the reality is, is like the climate world has been living in this fear world for too long. And I actually see and have met with enough people that, you know, are, are trying to work, you know, on economic solutions for uh, carbon capture that or utilization that make products that people are going to want to consume for a long period of time, whether or not that is fuels or foods or um, extension of, you know, existing projects that, uh, that are things we consume every day um, from the legacy uh, energy business. Yeah. Well, complex problems, complex solutions. I think there's been a ton of knowledge dropped on this. We could go for another 20 minutes easily on this topic, but selfishly, because you and I are friends and we've talked a lot on the podcast, let's go into some other stuff. Uh, I'm sure we'll get an update on the carbon vert here in the future, but man, a lot's uh, happened. We've, you know, did the podcast for a long time together. We're hosting uh, kind of weekly or biweekly uh, either guests or just chatting about things in general. I miss those times. Like sometimes my favorite stuff is just kind of the off the cuff, off the cuff, whatever we were interested in that week type of discussions. Um, and it's been a journey, man. Like I was just looked at YouTube today and 25,000 hours of watch time on the channel. So that's like, you know, a thousand something days of people tuning in and it's come a long way since the first time I think you came on, there was a couple hundred views and hundreds of views, maybe thousands. And, uh, now it's, it's, it's grown. And I feel like I've grown. I think you have too, but happy to take it. Um, which direction you want to go to? I know you mentioned like real estate gold. I mean, I know that the, uh, that the markets are crazy right now. So maybe just, uh, you can ask me something or I can ask you, but just love to get your thoughts on what you want to chat about the back third here. No, congratulations actually on building your own brand and kind of building things out. I listen to, um, listen to you regularly. I think it's an, an interesting kind of channel uh, that you're carving. The, the real estate side is something that I'm just personally, you know, I think there's like long-term hard assets is, you know, what I actually think carbon storage sites will end up being uh, and kind of things around that. But as you've gotten into real estate, what what's changed? You know, we haven't talked about it for probably 18 months and interest rates have changed. You've got projects moving forward and you've put a lot of capital at risk. You've, you know, it seems like things are scaling. I'm, I'm just curious if you're looking today is what would you do differently today knowing what has happened versus the decisions you made uh, over the last 18 months? Yeah, it's, a lot's changed. I mean, to start out, we were doing single family homes and we were in a, a real positive rate environment. And it was a very basic thesis. And that was, I was listening to a lot of macro podcasts. I'd been interested in real estate for a while before I bought my first rental property and had owned homes. So I was like, well, this is easy because I've owned a house. I've bought a house. I know the problems and the maintenance involved. And that was kind of dipping our toes in. But it was also at the time in 2019 is when I started, uh, bought the first property, then really started buying a lot of properties in 2020. And it was just this idea that the fed is putting rates super low and, you know, money is really cheap and the dollar is being devalued. We saw them printing all the money and it was the same thing that got me interested in Bitcoin and other things as well. Since then, obviously, uh, you can look at interest rates or you can look at the M2 money supply. Uh, the government is trying, the Fed is trying to contract the money supply and contract credit. And so it's a very different uh, market environment than when we first invested. Mm -hmm. And I think that the smartest thing that we did was we took wins, you know, like you kind of have to understand where you're at in the life cycle of a business or the life cycle of a market. And when we sold out of pretty much everything in our portfolio over the span of 2021 and and early 2022, I think we sold our last property at like the top, like at February of 2022, kind of before rates uh, started yeah. started spiking. And so, you know, I think you would have been hard pressed not to, you know, two X your equity in real estate over that time period of 2020 to 2022, if you sold. Um, and we did, I mean, like most of our investments were two to three times our money in a very short period of time, which we knew was like not normal or probably realistic. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that the main thing was, and you know, the other thing too, is it's hard to divest a good property because it's cash flowing. It's got a lot of positive benefits. Uh, if, if interest rates had gone down in that time, your cost basis was probably pretty good. So yeah. that's how, you know, we were looking at it. It was like, we're well, really low cost basis. We, you know, these properties are all cash flowing. 
but it just made too much sense. Like if, you know, if you see a double, uh, you see an opportunity to two extra money, you know, there's that saying, it's like, don't walk, run, you know? And then like yep. the velocity of money is a big thing. And so I that think was one of the, that is a good yeah, go key. Ahead. So did you double down? Did you like put the wins back in or that's the yeah. one thing that I, yeah, yeah, we did. But we, <laughs> what we learned about from it was that we saw the retail buyers and we saw mm -hmm. upstream. And I think that the biggest thing that we did after the first round of investments was we looked at how much money was being made upstream. Now there's also risk mm -hmm. involved going upstream, but the margin. So, so much you higher. went into building your own building like, our yeah. own and then yeah. buying raw land. And I think that like with the building of the properties, like today we, you know, our cost basis is even with the market prices coming down and we're still like 30% lower than what we would have paid. Had we bought kind of in that time period at the top when we started mm -hmm. building, it was like stuff is going into bidding wars. And then even when interest rates mm -hmm. went up, prices didn't come down immediately and people were still transacting at these elevated, you know, valuations. And I think that our thesis was, we know number one what a good product is we've learned about what we like what we don't like about the properties we've owned and so it was a chance to really take control instead of just going onto the marketplace you just see what comes available and you're like oh mm -hmm. i like this about this property but i don't like this and so you kind of you some properties you may buy it you take something that you like and you take a negative with it but whereas when you can build you can uh you can kind of craft it the way you want to so cost basis was the main thing um and then the other thing and so that was the positives The negatives is just a lot of work. Honestly, the biggest negative of all of it has been, there's a reason why you pay more when you buy retail is because it takes a ton of work to build a home. And mm -hmm. we're just starting to see the fruits of that labor with some of the properties that are coming online. They're incredible. And the market cool. response has been good, but man, it's just, it's a lot of work. It's a real business. Um, moving into the future. I think like it's going to matter what your cash flow profiles look like um, in a rising rate environment. I think NOI net operating income is massive and being able to prove that yes, rates have gone up, but look at the cash flow that this property is generating. And also the other thing that I think we've done a good job about is being well capitalized and mm -hmm. having the, you know, the balance sheet to ride things out and to not be in a situation where you're like in a distressed situation because sure. over time with real estate, you know, things tend to be okay, but like there are stretches like in the eighties or in 2008. I mean, really like I like, yeah. to, I brought this up a lot. I mean, from 2000, I bought my first house in 2012 and I sold it in 2019. It didn't appreciate that much. I mean, it went up like 8%. Like it was mm -hmm. not a high appreciating property. I mean, market was kind of flat for a decade after 2008 or longer. So you go through these things where like, you know, nothing happens for years and then everything happens in a week, right? Or a couple of weeks. And that's kind of how this last year has been. It's like, you know, that's how COVID was, right? Yeah. Nothing, the market had been anemic and then it like shot up and now the market's in kind of a downturn. And so for us, it's like quality properties and um, and um, being conservative do, on the balance sheet. So like do that. you lever each property or how do you form, like is every property its own separate uh, capitalized uh, or do you have like a hold code that holds all of them or I'm ignorant? So like, is it a, yeah. like, like how do you our, collateralize um, like well, you got, get construction got, loans, I assume, right. uh, given you're taking on that risk. Um, yeah. So it's a little well, different got, than. You've yeah. got like the land itself, which can be used as collateral. So if you bought a lot or a piece mm -hmm. of land with cash and there's no debt on it, then you can probably gotcha. build a house without having to put any more equity in, or you can finance okay. the lot and then roll that into a construction loan. Um, the properties we have are in a fund. So there's like the fund has all those properties held in it. They do have different banks and different um, mm -hmm. loans for each property. But I think in the future, there's a real scenario where we collateralize that into one facility. Um, you know, we try to go like long. Paperwork wise, that would be a little yeah. hassle. But... It would be, I mean, like there's just, there's a nice thing about having different banks. Like every bank does something better and worse than the mm -hmm. others. And so having those relationships, it, there's two, there's a point of diminishing returns with that, right? You don't want 20 banks, but to have two, three, four banks is probably a good thing. Um, and then I think like, you know, with real estate, it's kind of game or th game of Thrones. And I think this is, people don't realize it, but it's like, you kind of win or you die. I mean, it's like when yeah. you have leverage, right. I mean, there's only two outcomes really. I mean, you either have a successful project or you don't, and the non-successful projects can be can be bad. So that's what comes back to the being conservative. But like the underwriting for these loans is pretty strict. I mean, like they want, you know, 
30 to 40 percent mm -hmm. down um maybe you, if you someone went out and did it on a one-off they could probably do like a second home type mortgage and get 20 percent down or 15 percent down maybe and and have it you know on a one-off basis but like for a commercial size yeah. uh type thing like they want you to uh pledge collateral they want a lot of equity and then i think like after you get track record and after you pay down debt you can get um you know, non-recourse debt at some point. And so in most of the things we've done, we try to have a pathway to non-recourse where it's like, Hey, after we get to 40% equity or whatever, this goes yeah. non-recourse, just the property is the, is yeah. the collateral. No, it's, uh, yeah, there's just this analogy. The reason I wanted to ping you on real estate was as I think about our base business, there is, you know, in carbon Vert, like you know, taking wins makes sense. Like being in a position to get into the right properties at the right spots, like location, location, location matters. Like we try to right. be on top of good geology near, near emitters that we think want to capture their carbon. And, you know, we're, um, happy to form partnerships with larger companies and smaller companies. And, you know, it's just that kind of nimbleness of you know, getting developments moving forward. Um, the duration is longer. That's probably the one thing that is, you know, our first project by you bend, uh, was awarded in 2021 for the offshore component and injection is five years after that. And I think that as the world ramps up, you know, there's going to be an entire, you know, service industry of, you know, companies, you know, trying to drill. Well, it's going to be really interesting. Like, are we going to see, you know, barge and jack up rigs in the offshore drilling CO2 injection and monitoring wells. And, you know, what's going to happen around, you know, seismic onshore needs as you're starting to understand, you know, this geology that, you know, you'd never actually drilled cores through a lot of these because they're saline aquifers. And so no one, you know, no one cored that, even though the oil and gas world has shot seismic across all of it. And you have to do that. Um, like this transition of like, legacy oil and gas skills uh was probably why i chose carbon over anything else um and it just seems to be fitting um and hopefully in the next you know month or so we'll have have some you know announcements and we'll be doing some new things and some old things uh so look forward to updating again um anything else you wanted to cover what about you mentioned gold and, yeah, yeah, gold, you mentioned and gold and oil and some stuff to, like just I mean, talk just about see, your thoughts there i mean Right now, the, the oil markets, and I do think the cut always says that like there's near term weakness possibly before we get into this long term kind of destocking of volumes that I think supports oil back into the you know into the 80s, um, which is a huge difference. And I've I've talked to enough people about upstream companies for a long time, but seventy dollar oil today is like upstream investing purgatory for the US. Because if oil goes down 10 bucks, you're in a real issue of negative free, like you don't have free cash flow, your dividends and distributions go down. Oil goes up 10 bucks, you're at 80 and it doesn't change things that much. Like you're this like plus 10 is okay and people feel better about it, but it doesn't really like, you know, pivot um, a lot of the numbers into like super high yields or, you know, opportunities for big buybacks. Now yeah. oil at 80, now minus 10 is down to 70, which doesn't change things that much, but oil goes from 80 to 90. And now you get this, you know, huge ratchet up of free cash yields uh, that just totally changes the profile of these companies that are, you know, kind of playing with high single digits. They start getting into, you know, 12, 15, 18% free cash yields as you move, you know, north of 80, uh, and up. And so like this, this push pull of the near term, you know, I, I do have to take anytime, you know, you see a cut uh, from OPEC plus, you know, they're seeing something that is more negative than positive uh, for the short time frame, And they're trying to support price. Um, but as I think forward, just a little bit forward into the back half of the year and first half of next year, um, you know, I just have this really underlying belief that, you know, oil prices will end up being higher as all hard commodities, I think, you know, inflate somewhat higher. I think gold continue, you know, I've been a gold bug since well, kind of end of last year, personally, you know, I still think that it makes a lot of sense. I think buying natural gas is this weird, I've taken some losses in natural gas stocks and I'm trying to decide if I want to get back in yet. Um, I'd probably buy a little bit of 
like long dated oil um, before gas uh, right now. But you know, that's been how I've been thinking about things. I, I do love the market still. What, what's been so interesting to me is like carbon markets have just collapsed. Like European mm-hmm. carbon went from, you know, 60 to 100 as you had all this coal fired uh, power coming online. And then I don't know if you've seen European electricity prices are negative. And so you've had this flood of carbon prices have collapsed to below 80 bucks in the EU ETS. You know, back in the day, we talked about trading KRBN and GRN. Um, you're seeing, you know, low carbon fuel standards and carb trying to reestablish um, a price point where you can continue to have the success they've had reducing emissions in California. Uh, but as you've flooded that market with, you know, e-fuels and renewable natural gas and, you know, low emissions vehicles, the price of uh, carbon per ton in California has gone down, which is what you want to have happen over time. The same way that in the 90s, you know, socks, uh, sulfur dioxides traded to like eight, 900 bucks a ton. And now they trade at pennies because, you know, we've cleaned up our emissions from most of the power and automotive sector uh, and industrial sector. And so like the price of carbon over time should do what European electricity is doing, uh, which is, you know, trade off to almost no value as emissions are you know, captured effectively or or avoided. Um, and I'm talking 100 year time. I'm not talking right. you know, my kid's lifetime and maybe maybe yours. Uh, definitely not mine um, at this point. And that's what I get excited about is these market solutions are definitely coming. Um, and that's, uh, that just feels right. Um, and some of the work I just for I, I do want to give people a couple things that are worth following up on. Uh, everybody should read some of the work the bipartisan policy center is doing. Um, they really do a good job of framing, you know, the spectrum from left to right to really a bipartisan policy on a lot of topics. Um, I've enjoyed participating you know, there's like decarb uh, is another set of conferences that are worth attending if you're trying to understand um, carbon pricing. And then strangely, you know, in the stock market, I've been perplexed by other than Denberry, um, I could I could very reasonably say there isn't a public company that is getting value for carbon today. If anything, maybe you're seeing a negative uh, in some of some of the companies because of the capital they're spending without a clear you know valuation mark. Um, even when CRC got a mark, a valuation mark, uh, from Brookfield, their stock didn't really respond that much, which is, which has been interesting to me. Um, just because I, I see what the public, you know, doesn't yeah. see, which is their evaluation marks, uh, that are coming. Um, and I think that is going to be meaningful and, and important, um, to how these, uh, how the public markets, uh, value. You know, this new resource uh, or new uh, excess, which some people say is carbon. Um, yeah. So that's what I'm thinking about. So, yeah, good catching super up. interesting. And it is good catching up. The markets lately have been crazy. It's been, uh, I think the hard asset thesis is a good one. I'm really interested to see what the Fed does over the next two years going into an election cycle. Um, most of the government debt right now is financed at, you know, incredibly low rates. Had a guy, like, you know, Luke Groman on recently and some of the stuff he talks about, but just how does this flow through to like the different bets you can make, right? And it's like, does the government really refinance? And I think it goes to like 40% of the fed- federal budget is on interest payments alone if they have to refinance at the current rates. Um, part of me says that's never going to happen, but is that also kind of inflationary, right? That just means more spending to be able to meet yeah. the fiscal side, you know? So it's like Luke Groman kind of made the point like either way is inflationary. It's like, whether they, you know, mm. keep rates higher and then you have to just print more on the fiscal side to achieve the goals that we're trying to achieve or they lower rates and asset prices go higher. But it doesn't seem like there's a pathway forward that's not inflationary um, other than maybe some crazy AI thing or something that, you know, productivity gains that we can't fathom at this point, but uh, probably a topic of a different conversation, I would think. Yeah, we could spend a separate set of time talking through that. Um, but it was definitely good catching up and, yeah. um, look forward to seeing what you have coming in the coming weeks. And I'm glad you, uh, asked, yeah. uh, I'm glad to talk about it. And if anybody has questions, my email is hike at carbonvert, H E I K at carbonvert.com. Just email me and I'm happy to walk through things. One of the things I try to do is educate the world around how, 
how carbon pricing and you know how how this tax credit monetization and really how these projects move forward and you know, do they or do they not make money uh, would rather engage in conversation than uh, you know tweet storms. Yeah. Um, so happy to do that. All right. All right. Thanks. All right. Thanks, guys. Bye, y'all. Thank you.